Hello, my name is Benita. For those of you I haven't had the pleasure of meeting yet in person, I'm married to Pastor Samuel, and Pastor Tommy thought that it might be a fun idea if I did the devotion for today. So it's a pleasure to get to do that with all of you. So for those of you that don't know, I'm a licensed mental health counselor, which is just a fancy way of saying I'm a therapist or a counselor. And I also went to seminary with Samuel and served with him in ordained ministry for a few years. So it's really my passion to walk alongside people who are suffering and struggling um, through being a counselor, but it's also from a biblical perspective. So I thought a good topic for right now that's really relevant for everything we're going through as a country and just as people would be to talk about anxiety and meld scripture with some therapeutic tools that you can use to help you with your anxiety. So what I've done is pull four scripture verses that are really commonly used when it comes to combating anxiety. And I'd like to give you one verse, talk about it, and then give you a therapeutic tool to help. Um, and hopefully flesh them out a little bit because a lot of times we're just told, fear not, cast your anxieties, do not be anxious, but we don't always know the why or the how or the because, so hopefully we can flesh that out a little bit. So the first verse I picked was Isaiah 41.10, and these are not in a particular order for any reason, but Isaiah 41.10, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So the first thing we're sort of told to do when it comes to anxiety is fear not. Or what I like to say thematically is trust. Trust. Do not be afraid. Trust God. But right there in that statement, right after fear not, we're told the why. Trust God or fear not because I am with you or God is with you. So the reason we're not afraid, the reason we can trust God isn't because our circumstances are suddenly going to become less stressful or things are necessarily going to go our way. We're trusting God will not leave us alone. He's not going to abandon us in those circumstances. In fact, as the, the scripture indicates, he is going to help us and strengthen us and uphold us with his right hand. I always like to picture like a big strong dad holding their child up over like water or something muddy or something that they don't want them to get into. He's upholding us. So he's not going to let us fall prey to those circumstances because he's always with us. That is what we're trusting. So one therapeutic tool that I thought I'd give us is a mindfulness breathing exercise. And it's called 457 Breathing. You can Google it, but we'll go over it quickly here. And all you do is breathe in through your nose for a count of four. So, and hold your breath for a count of five. Then slowly breathe out of your mouth for a count of seven. And it's just a calming breathing exercise. And there's something about the holding your breath part that really does help release some anxiety. And you can do that as many times as you need. And in fact, the more you practice that throughout the day, even when you're not anxious, usually the stronger it works when you are anxious. But what I like to add is I like to do one set of breathing and then say, fear not for God is with me. Then if I need to do the breathing exercise again, do it. And then fear not for God is with me. And it's just a really great way to be mindful and present and calm yourself. But we're adding in the scripture, which is the ultimate reason we know that we can calm ourselves is because God is with us. So the second verse I chose was 1 Peter 5, 7, and it says, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. So this statement I take to mean we are to give God our concerns or cast our anxieties on him, as it says. And again, this verse gives us the remedy or the reason why right there. We do this because he cares for us. So God is sovereign and omnipotent and the creator of the whole world. And yet he's telling us, give us our worries. Even if we think those are small in comparison, he says he wants them. Literally, some translations say, throw them on him. They care about our experiences. He cares about our experiences and our concerns. And I kind of think of my seven-year-old, when I used to pick him up from school back when it wasn't coronavirus and he could go to school. And 
he would like spit out all the information. Mom, Mr. Carnahan says we need this, this, and this, and I'm gonna need Valentine's for this, and this party, and you sign up for this field trip. Okay, great. <laughs> He's just fine and tuned out and talking about the rest of his day. And he literally throws it on me because he knows I care and he knows I've got it. And yes, sometimes because I'm a human, I have to say, okay, one more time, what did he say? Or go back and message the teacher. But he knows ultimately that I'm going to take care of it. It's okay. He can just throw it on me. So an exercise that I like to practice, and this is really good with kids and adults actually, is it's called worry trash. And you can keep a post-it or a tab, tablet, notepad, next to the trash or at your nightstand, or if you wanna keep it somewhere private, that's fine too. And what I like to do is tell people to write down whatever they're worried about. And it can be chicken scratch, only you have to know what it is. And you can write it for your littles if they can't write yet, or you can tell them to draw it. That's actually a really good therapeutic exercise. And what you do is you write it down, then you read it to yourself, and then you crumple it up, and literally toss it in the trash. And what we're really doing here is we're not brushing the worry under the rug because that's not gonna help things either. We're acknowledging it, we're naming it, we're giving space for it, we're acknowledging that that is something that's bothering us, but then we're not gonna give it power. So we're symbolically crumpling it up and throwing it away. And literally picturing, not that God is obviously a trash can, but that we're throwing it away and it's not going to be our issue anymore. The next verse I chose was Matthew 6, 34, and it says, therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And I, I don't remember if I said it, but it's Matthew 6, 34. <laughs> and here, what I hear being said to us is that we need to limit our focus. Jesus has literally in this verse given us a boundary. He's put a fence around our concerns. And he does this because he knows we're finite and mortal and we really can't handle the weight of knowing the future and we can't know the future. So he gives us a protective boundary, not unlike telling your kids, don't cross the street, you stop here. Here's where the danger comes and I've got that. So you stay right here. He limits our focus to today. And really, instead of looking at it as something that's limiting, we wanna look at it as something that's freeing. He's saying, you don't have to worry about this. Don't go past this. And then you don't need to worry about what lies ahead. I've got it, I'm here. He's literally telling us, you don't have to do anything. Just focus on this. So a therapy technique that I really like for this verse is something that we use called grounding. There's lots of different grounding techniques, but I'm gonna give you one of them. And it's exactly how it sounds. You just ground yourself. Anxiety often gets us in a whirlwind thoughts will ruminate. They'll even become obsessive and intrusive. We can't stop worrying. It's 2 a.m. and we're thinking about this and we're thinking about that or we read the news and now we're going down this spiral of this thing and it really takes over us. So we want to ground ourselves and become rooted again. Thankfully, we get to become rooted in the word, which is something that really does work and is a firm foundation as we know. So for grounding, this exercise that I'm going to give you is super simple. When you start to feel yourself getting carried away with anxiety, Literally just start naming things that are true. Try not to pick controversial things, just facts. My name is Benita. I am five feet tall. My husband is Samuel. I go to New Hope. I painted my walls gray. And the things can get bigger and you're just gonna keep naming things that are facts and that are true. And they can be scriptures. Even simple, Jesus loves me. This I know because the Bible told me so. Even something that simple, because what you're reminding yourself and coaching yourself is, yes, there's a whirlwind of scary things you can't control, but there's a lot of things that are true, that ground you, that haven't changed, that aren't unfamiliar, and that you know. So we're just coming back down out of the anxiety cycle. So the last scripture I wanted to give you is Philippians 4, 6 through 7, and this one's used a lot. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So here we're told, don't be anxious. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> Easier said than done, right? And we're kind of given these three commands. Do not be anxious. Instead of worrying, pray for what you want and thank him for your blessings. And the because behind this is because he promises to wrap his peace around us like a shield when he says he'll guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. 
So the thing is, we can kind of become formulaic about this, and that's not what we're shooting for. It's you, it's not always so easy as, okay, I'm going to tell myself not to be anxious. I'm going to pray for what I want. I'm going to count my blessings, and then I'm going to feel better. Um, it's I wish it were that simple, and it's not. The piece that's promised in the original Greek is Irene, which can mean joining something that was separated, a state of harmony, an inner rest and well-being, and a freedom for disturbance. The thing is, this piece, this Irene that we're talking about, really isn't about our relationship with the world. It's not that there will be no turmoil in our circumstance. It's the peace that we find in our relationship with our creator. It's, we had turmoil with God. We were not right before him. We were not in a state of harmony with God. We were not free from our disturbance. We were separated from God, but we have Jesus. That's what's wrapping us in peace. That is what brings us to our creator in harmony. And it's that relationship, that harmonious relationship between man and God and woman and God, that is the peace that we receive. And that peace is what carries us through circumstances that may not always seem peaceful. So again, it's not freedom from trouble necessarily, but it's freedom in that relationship with God. So the last therapeutic technique I'd like to give you is what I call the prayer of letting go. And it is just a prayer. It's just a more directed prayer where we kind of visualize what we're doing. And it's rooted in Philippians 4, 6 through 7. And what I like for us to do is whatever it is we're stressed out about, it could be a lot of things. I kind of want us to picture, see if you can see, cupping it in your hands. And you're doing all of this prayerfully. So you're cupping that worry. You're kind of holding it almost like it's a little rubber ball. You get the picture. And part of why we do this is so that the worry doesn't seem so big. We're holding on to it. We're talking about it. We're thinking about the worry. And then what I want us to do is take a deep breath, name the worry in prayer to God, then open our hands. And then what we're going to picture is that worry is like a balloon. And we're going to watch that worry float up and out of our hands and float into the air and visualize watching it float higher and higher and higher until it disappears and we cannot see it anymore. And whatever that worry it is, once it disappears out of our sight, we're going to say, I give it to you, God. And then we're going to picture sunshine or some people like rain, whatever it is, sort of beating down on us and beaming down on us. And we say, God, Thank you for your peace with hands open. And then we close our hands and we accept that peace. So it's really just a visualization prayer of literally watching our worry float away into God's care and then receiving and accepting his peace. And we're going to do this with our hands. We know that there's lots of positions of prayer on our knees, laying down, standing up, hands in the air. And this is just another position of prayer that can help maybe make this Philippians verse come to life. So the last thing I want to leave you with, and hopefully those things helped in some way, is how we help each other. And Proverbs 12, 25 says, anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. And so what I want us to leave with is, of course, we're not alone. We have Jesus. God is with us. That is evident in those verses. But we can also be there for one another. We can bear each other's burdens. And what I suggest when anyone is suffering or struggling with anxiety or anything is that you just provide them with companionship and an encouraging word. And instead of giving them platitudes like, um, God doesn't give you anything you can't handle, he must know that you're strong, there's something he wants you to learn, which have their place in certain times, we want to encourage one another by saying, I'm with you. I will walk through this with you and provide a listening ear and just the companionship of conversation. Um, so thank you for letting me talk to you today, and I pray that our God gives us all the peace that surpasses understanding and that it's something we can really delight in and hide in even and let that be a guard for us in the face of anxiety.